Jesus said, Man cannot live on bread alone, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You're listening to Daily Truth. The last is the civil law. Ceremonial, moral, civil law. Civil law, what we ultimately have throughout the Old Testament in Israel, the nation state of Israel under the Old Covenant, is civil law as case law. And it's the same kind of law, it's the same premise that our law has been based on in America. Now that's eroding, but that originally was the goal. That was the idea. And and what that means is that there are certain civil laws, well, all of the civil laws, um, individual cases that came up in Israel, and God gave a law. What do you do when this happens? What do you do when that happens? What do you do in this situation? What do you do in that situation? But what we need to recognize is that every civil law in Israel ultimately has its root. It stems from the moral law, right? So so the, the, the borders on the edges of the roof, Right, you need to have a paraplete. You need you need to have um, you need to have this precipice, this this uh, boundary along the edges of your roof, right? Because well, in their culture, they didn't have HVAC, they didn't have air conditioning during the summer months. They would sleep on top of the roof in order to stay cool, to have a fresh breeze. But but someone, if there wasn't a border, could roll off of the roof and be horribly mangled and injured or even die. So so what is the the blueprint, what's, what's the general equity would be the term? Um, in the moral law, the Ten Commandments, the Sixth Commandment, thou shalt not murder. That's in the negative sense, but stated in the positive, thou shalt not murder means thou shalt protect and esteem and cherish the sanctity of human life, those who have been made in the image of God. So when you look at our culture, you might think of speed limits, perhaps. Now, I I won't say seatbelts. You might think of seatbelts, but I would actually say that seatbelts are an infringement on liberty. (laughs) And and all the grandpas, all of our grandpas, if they were here and still alive, they would have said, amen, right? Like uh, my my grandpa, my dad's dad, cut the top part of his seatbelt. He's like, I'll wear the lap portion, but I'm not wearing this shoulder thing, right? I I have rights. I have rights. I'm not wearing it. And you know what? This is what I would say. That has to deal with your safety. That's why I would say seatbelts is different. It has to do with your safety. And your choice, where speed limits affect other people's safety. Do you see what I'm getting at? So the border on the roof stems from, the, that's a civil law in Israel, but it stems from the moral law, the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder, stated in the positive sense, thou shalt esteem the sanctity and, and cherish and protect the sanctity of human life, those created in the image of God. And so my point is this, the moral law of God transcends forever. It is always binding, eternally binding, not just on Christians, but all people. Because God is universal father? No, he is only father of those who have been adopted by grace through faith in Christ. But he is universal creator. And it is on the premise, on the basis of him being creator, that he reserves the right to implore and to impose his laws. That's the moral law. The civil law, though, what we need to understand is sometimes we we make the civil is separate from the moral law of God as a ceremonial law. And that's a mistake. The civil law has its root in the Ten Commandments. All these hundreds of civil laws, they all stem, their general equity comes from the moral law of God. That's what the Westminster Confession says and it's what the 1689 Confession says. If you look of of the law of God, the chapter that deals with the law of God, both in the Westminster and the 1689, it speaks to the moral law of God, it speaks to the ceremonial law of God being abrogated, but then it speaks to the civil law of God and it does not say that the civil law that Israel had is abrogated. Rather, what it says is that the general equity of the civil law continues because the general equity is rooted in the moral law, the eternal Ten Commandments. And we have a New Testament example. I'm going to give it. It sounds a little bit self-serving, but it's the best example in the Bible in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul does this. He says, do not muzzle the ox while he treads the grain. And then the argument he makes is pay your pastors. He says, if, if the pastor is doing the work of the gospel, he should, he should reap a harvest from the work that he's doing. But, but notice how Paul makes the argument. He doesn't just make it from logic, right? What's the basis of the authority for, for the apostles' argument for paying pastors? He doesn't just say, well, well, I'm a minister and I'd like to get paid. So he doesn't argue from experience. It's not an emotional argument. He doesn't write some narrative so that you would pity pastors. So the, the basis of authority is not emotion. It's not personal experience. It's the law of God. But what portion, what division of the law of God? Civil law. 
He says, you want, it was commanded to Israel not to muzzle an ox when he treads the grain. And he says, and God is not concerned for oxen. That's not what God was getting at there. That's not his big concern. Is he not more concerned for people, for his image bearers? So in the same way, it would be, it was a civil law not to muzzle the ox. That, 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 that the one who, and he, he goes further with that, the one who uh, threshes, the thresher, the, the, the harvester, the, the agriculture, the farmer, should, should thresh in hope in hope that he's actually going to receive the fruits of his labor, that we should not sever people from their labor. They should reap some kind of benefit, whether it's it's an animal like an oxen or whether it's a farmer or whether it's a pastor. But Paul gives a New Testament commandment to churches in regards to paying their pastor, particularly the one who labors week in and week out in the preaching of the word, but he makes it on the basis of civil law. And what does he do? He takes this civil law about oxen treading grain, and he gets down to the heart of it. What's the general equity? And the general equity is found in the blueprint of the moral law of God. So what what moral law? What what of the Ten Commandments would, would be the blueprint or the general equity there? Thou shalt not steal, the Eighth Commandment. That's the, that's the general equity. That's the, the blueprint, the root. So the root of this commandment, civil law, about not muzzling an ox when he treads the grain, the root of that is the eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal, even from an ox. And then that general equity, thou shalt not steal, is then applied not, not in a one-to-one ratio from oxen to oxen in the old to new covenant, but from oxen to pastors and every other laborer and every other vo- vocation. So the point is this. Ceremonial law, Christ is our high priest, he's our final sacrifice, and he washes us and makes us clean. So he fulfilled the ceremonial law, but he also abrogated it. It is done away with. If you didn't wash your hands today, it's probably not a great practice, but you can still participate in worship. Okay? Um, the the, the COVID, uh, COVIDians, the branch COVIDians, they really tried to bring back uh, the ceremonial law, by the way. That's what that was. It was religious. It was religious. All right, so the ceremonial law has been fulfilled and abrogated. The moral law of God has been fulfilled by Christ because he was perfectly righteous, but is never abrogated. It was in existence before Moses and still in existence after Christ, his life, death, and resurrection and ascension. And the civil law of God is case law in practical circumstances that stems from the general equity of the moral law, the Ten Commandments. So what we have is we don't look at the civil law of Israel and then look at whatever nation we're in, whatever culture we're in, and draw a a one-to-one ratio. Well, this is what God said to Israel, and this is what we do in America. No, with civil law, what we do is it's a two-step, not a one-step, but a two-step process. We take the civil law, each case law issue in Israel, and we take it back to the Ten Commandments, back to moral law, so not just straight to America, but we take it to moral law. What's the general equity? What's the heart of this civil law? And then we take the heart of it, the general equity, and we apply it in our time and our place. And I would argue that this is theonomy. This is a general equity theonomy. So when we talk about being a theonomist, I am a theonomist for the record, and a lot of people don't like that, but I am a theonomist. But what I mean by that is I mean that the general equity of the civil law given to Israel has its root in the Ten Commandments, which are eternal. They're not just given to Israel. They're not just given to the church. They're given to all people in all times and all places, and we would do well to apply these things in our culture and our time with biblical wisdom today. Wait, 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 real quick before you go. Do me a favor, subscribe to our YouTube channel, click the bell so you'll be notified with all our new content as it comes out on a daily basis. And if you're willing to support this ministry, you can do so by going to rightresponseministries.com slash donate. Thanks so much. God bless.